Well, good morning. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Philippians chapter 2. This morning we'll be focused on verses 12 and 13. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Please join me as we pray. Heavenly Father, what a mighty God we serve. We come to you this morning, Father, to your throne boldly because you have adopted us as your sons and daughters. And so we know that you welcome us and you receive us with gladness and joy. What marvelous grace this is, Father, that we can come to you, the living God. As we praise you for your mighty work, especially that you sent your son Jesus to bear our punishment, to spill his blood, to fully pay our debt by incurring your wrath. As we come again today asking you to speak to us. We thank you for your holy word without which we would be without hope and without guidance in this world. We thank you for the assembly of your people, the church, the body of Christ. We thank you for the preaching of your holy word. And we ask you now, Father, to empower us to hear from you clearly, to have a fresh sighting of your glory and your grace this morning. And we pray that you would empower us to be doers of your word and not hearers only. But we need your help toward that end. And so, Father, fill us, move us, stir our affections for you. Grant us joy and faith as we look to you in your word this morning. We pray this in the mighty and magnificent name of our rock, our redeemer, our savior, and our king, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please read along with me in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. This is the word of God. This, is, this word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. It's a source of help and hope for us this morning. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. May God pre bless the preaching and the hearing of his word. Well, like some of you, I went to high school in the 90s, and I remember early on in that decade, while my stepfather was flying helicopters through Desert Storm, uh, we had a number of military recruiters coming through our school uh, at various times trying to win us over to their branch of the military to serve our country uh, as we defended it against enemies. And I remember hearing about a story at another high school where they had all of the recruiters come in one day and speak to the entire assembly of students in one hour. So they gave each of the branches 15 minutes to speak. And so the Navy got up first, and the Navy gets in there, and they start, you know, this guy starts talking about, you know, it's not just a job, it's an adventure. That was the motto of the day. And this guy goes right about 18 minutes, just a little over his time. So then the army guy gets up, and he comes up on the stage, and he doesn't want to be outdone, and so he gives their motto of the day, which is, be all that you can be. And he goes on, and he's appealing to the students to consider serving the country in the army. He goes right about 19, 20 minutes. And then the Air Force guy comes up, and you know he's up here, and he's like, okay, we're going to blow him up from way up high in the sky. Come join the Air Force. And he goes way over his time. And so the Marine comes up, as he walks up to the stage, he's got like two and a half minutes before the bell rings and chaos ensues as the students run out the door. And so for two minutes, the Marine just stands there and he looks out at the crowd and he scans every face. And with just seconds left before this bell rings, he looks out and he says, I see maybe three of you who can cut it as Marines. When the bell rings, why don't you three come see me and we'll talk. The bell rings and you've got guys, and if you know anything about men, you've got guys with full rides going to Harvard coming up, I'll fight! 
give me a gun, come on, I'll do it. He's got people just rushing the stage to talk to him. That's called negative motivation, and I know everyone in here has different experiences with that. In my experience over the years, I've met a number of Christians who approach the Christian life like that. And we start off full of enthusiasm, and we, and we give it all we've got. We run hard, and we want to honor the Lord. We want to fight, and we, want to, we, want, we don't want to be spectators in the stands. We want to be players on the field. And so they run as hard as they, come, as they can, but then trouble comes, and life gets busy. Fatigue begins to set in, and confusion leads to disillusionment. I think many of us, on the opposite side of that, we're, we're out there, and we know that we're not the three that he's talking to, and so we get discouraged from the outset, and we, we're, we're afraid of even trying, and so we get confused about what the Christian life is supposed to be about. And we, we come to passages like this, and we're just intimidated about, what, I, I don't even know how to, how to begin. Well, this morning, this passage that we're looking at today is one of the most significant passages in all of Scripture when it comes to the topic of sanctification. Sanctification is the doctrine of growing in godliness, the doctrine of becoming more like Christ. That's called sanctification. And this passage is, is one of the most important ones when it comes to this. Now, lest you be confused, this is a different doctrine than justification. When God justifies, when God saved us, he declared something about us once for all. He said, it is finished. You are righteous by grace through faith because of the atoning work of Jesus Christ. He counted us righteous because of the obedience of Jesus, which we sang about this morning. We heard about last week. In that moment, he also set us free from the bondage of sin, from the power of sin over our lives so that we no longer need to be slaves of sin. And he empowered us with his Holy Spirit to live the Christian life. It was a glorious moment. In that moment, he declared all of these things to be true over us. But while we are set free from the power of sin, God did not in that moment completely transform everything about our lives so that we are completely like Christ in that moment. We all know this by experience. That work was something that was started in that moment, but it's an ongoing process called progressive sanctification. Progressive meaning that it's ongoing and it's more and more. 2 Corinthians 3.18, he says that we are being changed from one degree of glory to another as we behold the glory of the Lord. That's what this passage is all about. So what I want to do this morning is I want to get really practical with you this morning about how this happens. How does this change take place in our lives? This passage is all about sanctification. It entails, it entails a degree of mystery in the realm of divine sovereignty and human responsibility because you see both at play here. You see you work it all out and you see God is the one doing it. So we get a little bit confused there because there's mystery in this. Well, over the last few months, as we've been walking through the book of Philippians slowly together, some of us have been putting this to memory and meditating on these verses, and we've seen the glory of Christ on display in this book in various ways as we've considered the power of God at work in the salvation of sinners, as we've seen the advance of the gospel through the suffering of Paul, as we see the example of Christ in his glorious humiliation, in the exaltation of Christ because of his obedience. You have all of these glorious indicatives about God and about us declared to be true, and our hearts are full of praise as we read about this, as we bask in the glory of God. And then we come to this passage this morning where we're called to work out our own salvation in fear and trembling, and we, we feel like we missed a turn somewhere. Wait a second, we, we, there's all this God's work, and now you want me to work it out, and we might get confused. This doesn't sound very grace alone like the rest of Paul. This leads to confusion and, and misunderstanding about the nature of the Christian life. Which is it? Is it faith or is it works? Is it effort or is it rest? 
But the good news this morning is that Paul is not confused. Paul is not having a, a confused moment where he, he's trying to say something he's want to correct himself. Paul is not confused because Paul is telling us here in this passage, while there's mystery, Paul is telling us very clearly that what God commands, he empowers. What God calls us to, he permits. He, he, he fills us. As, as uh, Bart pre- prayed this morning from John 15, he is the vine and we are the branches. Apart from him, we can do nothing. And so there is good news this morning. And so where do we go in light of all this? What do we do now? I want to, I want to address some things that in this passage that I see eating away at us and robbing us of some of the joy and some of the freedom that we have in the Christian life and our faith. You see, what we see in the Bible over and over and over again are men and women who, who don't just have an act of knowledge about God, of who He is, but they tend to commune directly with God. They walk with Him in such a way that is very personal and it's very provoking. In Exodus, we see that Moses for instance, talks with God face to face. Can you imagine that? As you read that passage, you think about that, what did that look like for Moses to talk to God directly face to face? Then you move in on to Isaiah, and Isaiah gets sucked up into heaven, and he's in this high and lofty place where he sees God exalted. And then you move on, and you see God whispering to Jeremiah. And you see David carrying on, and David just crying out, God, all I want to do is seek you in your temple. He has this very personal relationship with him. You move on to the prophets, and every one of them is hearing directly from God, walking with God, being moved by God. They live their lives in communion with the living God and for the purpose of proclaiming his glory and his grace that they have personally experienced. And so you see, what you see here is not just, I know about God, but I know God. And there's a huge difference, brothers and sisters. There's a huge difference in a head knowledge about God. It's one thing to be able to simply list his attributes and to talk about what God is like and how he operates. And it's a different thing to have a soul that communes with Jesus Christ. Throughout the Bible and through church history and today, God enters into intimate communal relationships with his people. He empowers us. He puts his spirit in us. And there's just a major difference between knowing about him and knowing him. And that's what Paul is after this morning. And what you see also over and over in Scripture again and again is that, is that there's this weird tendency with people that are afraid of God. And they're afraid to commune with him. And you, so what you see with Moses is when he comes back from the mountain and tells the people, God wants to speak to you. He wants to move in you and stir in you and walk with you all the days of your life. Do you remember how the people responded? Do you remember how they responded? They said, they, they thought about it, and they said, no, no, you talk to God, and you come back and tell us what he's like. Isn't that interesting? And Moses is like, what? Don't you understand the pillar of fire, the cloud himself? He wants to lead you and be near to you, and the people, they just shrink back, and they want him to mediate on their behalf. Later on, God speaks to the people of Israel directly about his desire to guide them and lead them, and instead, they ask God for a king. They want someone to mediate on their behalf, and so they, they point at Saul. Saul is the tallest and the most athletic guy that they see, that they know, and they say, what about that guy? That guy will be a, a wonderful mediator on our behalf. And you know, if you've read anything of the Old Testament, that didn't go well for the people. Or in the New Testament, you see this going on in the New Testament with people following Peter, some following Apollos, and some following Paul. And Paul's over here like, guys, are you kidding me? None of us, these aren't different teams. We're not competing against one another. You follow Christ as we do. And this affects us today as well. Right now I'm reading uh, with one of my sons, I'm reading R.C. Sproul's magnificent book, on the holiness of God. If you've not read this book, I would strongly commend R.C. Sproul's The Holiness of God. And one thing that Sproul says about encountering the living God is that it will will swell in you change. For nearness to him will expose all that you are and all that you are not. It reminds us 
of our finiteness. Encountering God reminds us of our creatureliness. You see that with Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6, he encounters the living God, and he just shrinks back, aware of how unworthy he was in that moment, and that bothers us. And so we'd rather just hear about him from someone else. And there's a great danger in this kind of secondhand faith. I remember talking to, uh, talking to John one time about a, a certain do- uh, doctrine, of, actually about this book, and I talked about this book, the book of Philippians, as the happiest book in the Bible. And it is. It's a wonderful, happy book full of joy. And as, as I said that, he said, now, are you saying that because that's your direct observation? Are you saying that because you read that somewhere? It was a good, it was a good question for me. Because I'm vulnerable to this. I can hear somebody else say something and not really take it on my own and just assume it. We love authors like John Piper and Jerry Bridges or whoever your favorite author or speaker is because they talk about their souls being stirred and the magnificence of God. And we look to this teacher or that musician and all these people who say great and glorious things about God but we want to just hear it from them rather than experiencing that ourselves. We, want, we just hope in the God who they have seen instead of seeing him ourselves. I was reading, uh, my wife has me starting a new Bible study plan for the summer, and yesterday I was reading in John chapter 4, and you have Jesus speaking to this Samaritan woman and telling her about everything in her life. And so she goes around and tells all these people, and it says in verse 39 that many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of this other woman's testimony. That's interesting. They came to faith because of this other person. That's wonderful. That's glorious. We want to celebrate the work of God that way. But they didn't stop there. They didn't stay there. They didn't just stay with the woman and say, okay, you tell us more. They pursued him. And then in verse 42, it says that they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard ourselves. And we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. And so this morning, this is what Paul is after. He is warning the Philippians about this very same thing. He's warning the Philippians, don't you live your life vicariously through someone else. Don't, not just in my presence, but much more in my absence. And listen, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have heroes. Goodness, I absolutely have heroes. In fact, <clears throat> my wife got me uh, last year for Father's Day, she got me the heads of dead saints. Unless you'd be concerned, they're, they're little statues of, of heroes of mine, uh, like Spurgeon and J.C. Ryle and John Bunyan. And they're heroes of me. They provoke me. In fact, Hebrews 11 and 12 almost command us to have these heroes and to follow their faith, to imitate those who've gone before us. But listen, heroes in the faith, teachers of the word, should serve as guides into intimacy with Jesus. And not simply as someone just to listen to as if they're the only ones who can experience it. We have to get it secondhand. They should serve as guides. So the good news this morning, brothers and sisters, is that what Paul is calling us to, what God wants from us, is to work out our own salvation, to make it our own. And he empowers what he commands. So two points this morning, very simple. Point one our part, point to God's part. I'm very creative. I understand. You're wild right now. Wow, amazing outline. Point one, our part. Verse 12, therefore, my beloved. First off, Paul, notice here, Paul is addressing people that he loves. He's not coming to them with a word of rebuke. In fact, one of, the thing, one of the reasons why Philippians is called the happiest book in the Bible is because there is no word of rebuke in the book. He is full of praise and thanksgiving for them, full of encouragement. You can see his heart being stirred with affection as he speaks to these people that he loves. So this is not a harsh word spoken out of frustration, but a tender word spoken in full affection and faith. Paul's desire for the Philippians and for us by extension this morning is that we would experience, remember back to, back to chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, that we would experience abounding love, 
and that we would be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus. His desire is our fullness, that we'd experience the fullness of God, and that's what compels him to say what he's about to say. Therefore, therefore is a very important word because it points us back to something else. Therefore is a word that reminds us that Paul has already said something that should serve as, as the incentive for what he's about to call us to. This word points us all the way back to chapter 1, verse 27, where Paul says, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This gospel of the Son of God, who in chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, humbled himself. He did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but he humbled himself, even to the point of death, becoming obedient, even to the point of death on a criminal's cross. This gospel, Paul is reminding us, of the Son of God who humbled himself in obedience to Father, and then God exalted him, as we heard last week. God highly exalted him as a reward for his obedience. And so Paul, as he says, therefore, it's with all of this in view, with all the weight and with all the force of all that he said to this point, he's saying, therefore, let us work out our own salvation. Make it your own. It's not you as Philippians, as a group, work out your salvation. It's not you as a big group, come together and do this. It is you in the present active tense. You as an individual, you personally work out your own salvation. And Paul, Paul is saying here, listen, don't just obey me. Don't just do this because I'm around you. Don't just do this in some kind of secondhand, vicarious way, but be, be obedient because like, the, like those in John 4, because you know him yourself, because you've tasted and seen his beauty on your own with your own eyes, and your own heart is full of affection for your, your Savior. So don't just live through me. Don't just bank on my faith, on my miracles, on my experience. Don't just bank on what I've tasted and seen and told you about. You dive in yourself. You find out yourself personally. Make it your own. And let me try to explain this, why this is so important, because I'm, I'm now in my 40s. It's a really weird thing to say. And a lot of what I do is... Um, uh, you know, in God's providence, I've, I've just got a lot of friends and uh, loved ones and, you know, dear saints in this church uh, and in other churches that um, walk through various seasons of suffering. And I read a lot about suffering. It's such a painful thing to walk through. And I want to prepare people for this well, along with preparing my own soul for it. Life is hard. It's hard. We get diagnoses that we don't like. We get news that we didn't expect. It's hard. If you haven't suffered much yet in this life, you just, just wait because it will come. It's hard. And here's the thing. There's, there is a day approaching when your small group isn't going to be there and your friends aren't going to be around you there's no speaker addressing you, no worship leader leading you in song. There's no Christian book on your shelf, no MP3 that you're listening to. And we're going to be all alone. And for most of us, this is going to happen early in the morning because we live in this country, likely in a hospital. It's going to be 3 a.m. and we're all we're going to be all alone. There's nobody around us. Your wife's not there. You're Husband's not there. They're watching the kids. Your pastor's not there because it's 3 o'clock in the morning. And your community group isn't there. And in that moment, all there will be is your hope in this God. What you know to be true about him in that moment as you lie there awake and you, and you hear the machines hissing around you, helping you breathe. Your relationship with this king of all things is going to be all important, that it's your own. And so the question of practicality that I have for you this morning, 
that I want to talk to you about is how. How do we work out our own salvation? How do you make it your own? The Greek word for work out, you can talk to Bart because he's really smart with this stuff, smarter than I, means, you ready for this? Work out. <laughs> it means to perform, to achieve, to accomplish, to effect, to bring it about, to produce. It appears 22 times in the New Testament. This verb signifies working it and finally accomplishing a task, making it done. This word has a sense of working at something until the task is actually accomplished. It means that we bring it about to do it, to effect it, to cause it to happen, to produce it. And listen, Paul is not here addressing unbelievers. He's not addressing unbelievers, but he's talking to the beloved. He's talking to believers. This is not bringing about justification because we don't produce that by working. We produce that by believing, by trusting. That comes by grace alone, through faith alone. This is sanctification. He's talking about our obedience. This isn't work for your salvation. This is work out your salvation. Do you hear the difference in that? It's not work for your salvation. It's work out your salvation. Work it out. Apply it to every area of your life. Make it your own. I absolutely love how one of my heroes in the faith, J.C. Ryle, in his classic must-read book, it's at the book table, go, go get it afterwards, book on holiness, addresses this. Listen to what J.C. Ryle says. In the epistles, believers are plainly taught to use active, personal exertion and are addressed as responsible for doing energetically what Christ would have them do. And they're not told to yield themselves up as passive agents and sit still, but to arise and work. A holy violence, a conflict, a warfare, a fight, a soldier's life, a wrestling are spoken of as characteristic of the true Christian. I love this. In justification, the word to be addressed to man is believe, only believe. In sanctification, the word must be watch, pray, fight. Brothers and sisters, we are called in numerous places throughout Scripture to work hard, to strive, to sweat, to labor. Sanctification is not effortless. We're exhorted to labor toward God in prayer, to train yourself for godliness. It will require work of you. It will require some action. Just to say this more starkly, holiness will not happen in your life apart from your effort. It won't. That's how God works. Now, how is this not contrary to the gospel? How is this not contrary to grace and to the doctrine of God's sovereignty over all things? How, how does this not contradict freedom from legalism? How is this not legalism? Work out your salvation. Are you telling me to work for it? That I need to put forth effort? Listen, just as I believe it is absolutely unbiblical to ascribe glory to anyone else but God, we are all debtors to mercy alone. We all want to heed the warning in Luke 18 about the Pharisee and the tax collector, the Pharisee who said, God, thank you that I'm not like these other men, and the tax collector who said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He ascribed glory to God. The Pharisee ascribed glory to himself. We want to be wary of that. Just as I believe it is absolutely unbiblical to say that, it is also absolutely unbiblical for you to say, well, if God is sovereign and salvation is all by grace, then I'm just going to sit here on my couch and wait for God to change me. Brothers and sisters, the Bible outlines for us what we call the spiritual disciplines. I love how one author calls them the habits of grace. And this list is so long, you, you know these things. It's Bible intake and prayer and meditation and fasting, silence and solitude. You can go on and on because there's lots of them. These things, brothers and sisters, are not given as law, but as means of grace, as, as 
ways to access the grace of God, as ways to experience the gift of the Lord. As we do these things, we are receiving from God. We do these things not so that, listen, this is crucial. We do these things not so that God might love us, but we do them because he loves us. We do them because this is how we might walk in the love of God and grow in our knowledge of God and grow in our affection for God. Not to earn his grace. But all of these disciplines, all of this effort, all of this labor, all of this straining and training goes absolutely against the grain of our culture. We believe that we should satisfy every appetite of our soul, don't we? If you're hungry, let's eat. Thirsty, let's drink. If you're tired, let's sleep. It's just so funny how different we can be today over a hundred years ago. Most of the books that feed my soul are written by people who are now dead. If you read the Puritans, you absolutely should prioritize reading the Puritans. Go talk to Lori at the book table afterwards. She'll introduce you to many of them. They're, they're wonderful saints who will stir your affections for the Lord. If you read them, their impulse here would be to press into God, to labor toward godliness, to get themselves under the waterfall of God's grace and just to drink it in more and more. They were not passive in their pursuit of the Lord, but they were actively pursuing, pressing in, running hard after God to receive from Him. They would do whatever it takes to be near Him and to walk in intimacy with Him. You read this throughout the Psalms. You think about Psalm 63 or Psalm 42 as, as the deer pants after water. So my, my soul pants after you, O oh God. I want to seek you in your, in your temple all my days. And so many modern books today, they, they encourage us to relax, to just chill out, to let go and let God, to just be passive in our relationship with him. And I want to be careful with you know, talking about the spiritual disciplines because like anything, we can so easily turn this into law, can't we? We can base our standing before God and how we feel about God based upon our performance on any given day. And so I want to be practical in some aspects, but I also want to be careful how I define it. So let me, let me explain this. When I get up and read my Bible in the morning, when I go to God in His Word each morning, and I try to press into Him, I do so not because I think it will please Him or displease Him, because I'm His child. I'm His child be loved. I am under mercy and not wrath. He loves me and he delights in me. He shouts over me with loud singing. That is the truth of the gospel, what he declares to be true over us. That is his posture toward us. When we go to him in the morning, we, should not exp we, we don't want to picture him as, as, okay, come show me how seriously you want me today. That's not God's posture. He's, he's looking to us like a father with a son. Come on, bud. Come spend some time with me. I love you. That's his posture toward us. And so I do this in the mornings because some mornings he shows up in mighty, mighty ways. It'll be this crazy little phrase right in the middle of some passage that the Holy Spirit will come down and open my heart to. And this small little phrase will just stand out powerfully and it'll ring true in my soul. And then I'll start singing and my wife, my kids, look at me like dad's lost it again. And I'll just feel so near to him that day. And it strengthens my faith. And it fosters and cultivates my hope. And so I pray because he shows up. But I fast because in the middle of some of those moments, he shows up and he whispers me and shows me that he really is better than that food or that show or whatever it is that I'm fasting from. A great place to start if you don't know much about these things, if, if prayer and fasting and meditation and silence and solitude are new to you, there's a wonderful little book by Donald Whitney called Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. It is full of gospel. It's full of grace. And it'll cultivate your affections for the Lord. It's a book I've read many times now. My soul is stirred every time. But brothers and sisters, we must find those ways that we can experience God's grace and to encounter God in the depths of our soul. The call is to work. Work out your salvation. Pray, press into God. 
Find out what fasting is. Find out what praying is. It's not complicated, but the way that you learn to pray is by praying. I mean, you can read all the books about prayer that you want, and it's good. Read books about prayer. I read books about prayer. But you, if, until you begin to pray, you'll never experience its benefits. It's all going to be theoretical. Get around people who pray. You all know them. Get around those people who pray. Surround yourselves with others who, who don't talk to you without stopping to pray at some point. I love Holly's grandma, who's with the Lord now. But Holly's grandma was one of these saints that I just loved being around because I'd be standing there just talking to her, and this little old lady, I'd be, I'd be telling her about my day, and I mean, five times in a two-minute conversation, five times in a two-minute conversation, she has prayed. She just, as I'm saying, yeah, you know, the other day my, my car's having some trouble, and she's like, Lord, I just pray that you would please help him with his car, please make it work so he can get to where he goes. And, and then she looked at me, and I, what else? Like, just eagerly, what, can, what else can I give before the throne on your behalf? And she loved to pray, and I want to be more like Holly's grandma in that respect. Find those who pray and get with them. Join Mike Stelic and others, other members of this church in that little room back here before Sunday meetings and pray with them. Grab your community group members and, and just have a night where you just get together and pray. Access God together. Look into your life and find, find out, look into the depths of your soul deeply and find those things especially those things that aren't really wrong, that aren't really bad, those things that are, that are just kind of morally neutral. But they, they rob your affections for the Lord. Whatever that is for you. So for me, you guys all know my, my silly little thing with the Dallas Cowboys. I, can't, I just can't follow them very closely. They break my heart and they, and they just destroy my affections. It's unique to Dallas Cowboys fans, certainly but I can't follow it too closely because when I do, I just give myself and I'm, I'm, I, I just lose self-control and I'm just looking at Sports Center all the time and I'm reading stats and, and I just give myself so much to it that I avoid my Bible. And I notice that the topics of conversation that I'm excited about with my kids aren't the things of the Lord, but they're the things of, of sports. And it just, I hear that warning in my mind, my kids are not going to remember all the things I told them. They're going to remember what I'm most passionate about. I want that to be the Lord. I want that to be my experience of God. So what is that for you? It's not inherently right or wrong, but they affect your relationship with him. Maybe it's food. Maybe it's relationships. Maybe it's social media. If social media is robbing your affection for Jesus, I'd say it's a great idea to take a break, to fast regularly from whatever that is for you. Look deep. Learn to be alone, to be quiet, and to think deep thoughts. Learn not to lie to yourself about what's going on inside of you, but to press in to the Almighty, to access that waterfall of His grace, and to drink deeply of that cistern that is not broken, but that fills. But we need God's help if we want to do this. This is a tall order. It's a lot of work, and we need his help. So that leads to point to God's work. Imagine if Paul stopped here. Imagine if Paul said, okay, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And he stopped there full stop. He'd be like that Marine just challenging you, okay, are you good enough? Show me how hard you can work. Or he'd be like shouting that Nike motto. You remember the Nike motto from the 90s? Just do it. Be like that. Just do it. Just, I, I, don't, I don't care. Just make it happen. You've had, you've had a boss like that that I don't care about the challenge that you have. Just do it. That's not where Paul leaves us. This isn't Nike. It's not just do it. It's not just do more, try harder, work faster. Because the problem is we can't just do it. We're weak. We're sinful. We're frail. We're not perfect. We struggle in various ways. We try to read the Bible, and we, and we just, our eyes keep getting off the, tr off the page. We're looking at the birds, and, and we're listening to, to their song, or uh, you, we, we think about journaling, but then we end up doodling, or, you know, whatever it is. I mean, we're frail creatures, and we need God's help. We know failure. We can't do this if it's left to us, and there's not much good news in that, is there? So this guy, Paul, is so gospel rich, it just pours out of him. So he can't leave us there, but he goes right on in verse 13. We must not divorce verse 12 from verse 13, but we keep going. 
It says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Finally, good news. This is good news. God empowers what he commands. I read something talking about uh, sanctification a few weeks ago. He said this. He said that it's like the difference between rowing and sailing. He had to clarify, sailing is not effortless. I've never sailed, but I've read about sailing. And apparently it requires a lot of work. The difference is that the power, the power is external. It's wind, it's spirit, rather than internal, the muscle, the flesh. There's plenty of work to do on a sailboat, plenty of work that needs to be done. There's some list like 60-something things, apparently, that need to be done on a sailboat to make it go. So there's lots of work that must be done. But listen, brothers and sisters, no amount of elbow grease, no amount of work will control the tide or bring the wind. So you can do all this work. You can do all this labor. You can work hard. You can train yourself. You can hoist the sail, but only the wind makes it go. John Bunyan, one of my favorite authors, puts it this way. Run, John, run, the law commands, but gives us neither feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly and gives us wings. Isn't that true? Isn't that great? Isn't that glorious? God empowers what he commands. He gives us, he calls us to fly and he gives us wings. Brothers, and sisters, we're not holy because we work. We work because we're holy. We are holy because of what Jesus has done, not because of anything inside of us. That's what makes Christianity Christianity. That's the good news of the gospel. If we get this order wrong, we will struggle all of our days with the spiritual disciplines. But if we center on the gospel, if we give ourselves to that, the disciplines become less like duty and more like delight, more like a feast and less like work. This is why, as odd as it sounds, making your Christian life all about trying to be a better Christian, trying to look like a good Christian specifically, is a good recipe for how to be a terrible Christian. Or at least a weak and defeated one. This is so important. This is crucial to understand. You cannot get the power to obey the law from the law itself. Power to change only comes from the glory of Christ. 2 Corinthians 3.18, by beholding the glory of the Lord, we are being changed from one degree of glory to another. So let's behold him. Let's do the work of looking to him. Let's do the work of praying to him, of interceding on behalf of others. Let's do the work of meditating on his word, of turning it over and over again in our minds. This is why Paul includes this command only after lifting our gaze to behold his glory. It's no, it's no accident that, that uh, Philippians 2, 12, and 13 comes after all of this glorious passages about the glory of God and Christ. He wants us to see his glory because that provides the incentive for change. That provides the power for change. While we're not paying attention, God is at work changing us. So how do we work out our, our own salvation? One last friend to speak to us on this. Charles Spurgeon responds this way. Beloved, grace all-sufficient dwells within you, believer. There is a living well within you springing up. So use the bucket. Keep on drawing. You will never exhaust it. There is a living source within. Continue to struggle. You will not exhaust the life force which God has placed within you. There is a growing mine of gold. So spend it. Keep on scattering right and left. Inexhaustible divine wealth is yours. Therefore, cease not to work it out. When we put our faith in Christ, we're united to him, and our union with Christ will always produce fruit. His grace will never be exhausted. We get new mercies from God every single day. Count on that. 
So this passage, as much as we can come to this and, and smell the kind of, oh man, this is, this is all about work. I don't, li- I don't like the work passage. I want more the indicative and the rest and relaxed passages. This passage fits hand in glove with what he said in Philippians 1, 6, that God will complete what he began. God is the one who's at work. Somebody else preached a passage, preached on this and said, who's really at work? God is really at work. Do we work? Yes, we work. We lift up the sail, and he makes it go. That's our job, is to lift up the sail. God will never let his people go. God will not sleep. He does not slumber. He is tirelessly active. We forget he does not. We backslide. He cannot halt, defer, or deflect his work. He is the active indweller, and he will complete his work in in you from beginning to end. And not just that, but look at how he finishes. He does this for his good pleasure. What God does in you brings him pleasure. How big of a category in your life is the pleasure of God? Do you know that your personal obedience brings God pleasure? Do you think about that? Do you think about living a life pleasing to God? Does that motivate you in the day? Do you think about the pleasure of God in you? Do you think about the fact that it makes him smile? When you come to him, your life in Christ is pleasing in God's sight. So brothers and sisters, the narrow path that Jesus calls us to is hard. It is full of challenges at every step. But oh, the joy to be had, the joy to be had in having this patient and loving God pouring out his grace in your life every single day and drawing us to himself in the middle of it all. God empowers what he commands. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Let's pray. Well, Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Lord, even as we read about efforts required of us, about work that we are to put out, We thank you, Father, that you do not leave us to ourselves to do it. We thank you that we are not working for our salvation, but we are working out our salvation. We are applying your work to every area of our lives. We are accessing more and more of your grace. That is what you call us to. You call us to use the bucket, to enjoy more of you, to access the water that you provide, to enjoy the food that truly satisfies And so, Father, this morning, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to make this our own. Help us, Lord, to benefit from others, certainly, but to let them serve as guides to access your grace. Help us to make this our own. Help us to do what you call us to by your empowering grace, by your empowering spirit. Father, I pray, Lord, for for every person in this room that we'd leave here today more aware of your grace than of our our work, more aware of your kindness than of our failings. And let us leave here eager to receive more from you, eager to grow in our godliness and eager to grow in the way that we reflect your grace to other people, to tell a great story about our great God. So help us toward that end, Father. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name.